Friday. Whether you are all packed and ready to head off on vacation, or staying home with family and friends, or getting ready to plan your next book club, we have some titles to share with you today. In case you didn't know, the library has over 50 book club in a bag sets that you can check out to use in your classroom or with your book club group. We have a binder filled with our titles and we have little brochures in the library that list all of the titles. We have juvenile book club in a bag, we have young adult, we have adult fiction and nonfiction, and we even have large print titles available for you. So on the table today, we just have a couple of our favorite or some newer titles to share with you. We'll start with Al Capone Does Your Shirt, A Tale from Alcatraz by Jennifer Chodenko. These guys are not your typical neighbors. In 1935, a 12-year-old Moose Flanagan and his family have just moved to Alcatraz, the infamous island that's home to criminals such as the notorious escapee Roy Gardner, Machine Gun Kelly, and of course, Al Capone. Moose doesn't actually get to meet the cons, but he does meet Piper Williams, the warden's daughter, who comes up with many schemes that she might as well be a criminal. Now Moose has to try and fit in at his new school, avoid getting caught up in Piper's countless plots, and keep an eye on his sister Natalie. All Moose wants to do is stay out of trouble, but on Alcatraz, trouble is never very far away. Our classic, The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. Ponyboy can count on his brothers and on his friends, but not on much else besides Trouble with the Socias, a vicious gang of rich kids whose idea of a good time is beating up on greasers like Ponyboy. At least he knows what to expect until the night someone takes things too far. The Gunkle by Stephen Rowley. Patrick, or Gay Uncle Pat, Gup for short, has always loved his niece Macy and nephew Grant. That is, he loves spending time with them when they come out to Palm Springs for long, week -long weekend visits, or when he heads home to Connecticut for the holidays. But in terms of caretaking and relating to two children, no matter how adorable, Patrick is honestly overwhelmed. So when tragedy strikes and Macy and Grant lose their mother and Patrick's brother has a health crisis of his own, Patrick finds himself suddenly taking on the role of primary guardian. Despite having a set of gunkle rules ready to go, Patrick has no idea what to expect, having spent years barely holding on after the loss of his great love, a somewhat stalled acting career, and a life that's not so suited to a six and nine year old. Quickly realizing that parenting, even if temporary, isn't solved with treats and jokes, Patrick opens his eyes to a new sense of responsibility and the realization that sometimes even being larger than life means you're unfailingly human. And before I forget, each of our book club in a bag comes with um, little questions to use during your book club, and then some of them even come with a little book club kit. So for the, um, the Gunkle, we get the reading group guide, we get the Gunkle rules that are mentioned in the book, as well as a martini recipe and another drink recipe. And like I said, each of our book club in a bags will have questions with them and some other related material. Next, we have The Plot by Jean Hamp Horlitz. Jacob Finch Bonner was once a promising young novelist with a respectfully published first book. 
Today, he's teaching in a third-rate MFA program and struggling to maintain what's left of his self-respect. He hasn't written, let alone published, anything decent in years. When Evan Parker, his most arrogant student, announces he doesn't need Jake's help because the plot of his book in progress is a sure thing, Jake is prepared to dismiss the boast as typical amateur narcissism. But then he hears the plot. Jake returns to the downward trajectory of his own career and embraces himself for the supernova publication of Evan Parker's first novel. But it never comes. When he discovers that his former student has died, presumably without ever completing his book, Jake does what any self-respecting writer would do with a story like that, a story that absolutely needs to be told. In a few short years, all of Evan Parker's predictions have come true, but Jake is the author enjoying the wave. He is wealthy, famous, praised, and read all over the world. But at the height of his glorious new life, an email arrives. The first salvo is a terrifying anonymous campaign. You are a thief, it says. And the last book we have to show you from our book club in a bag kits today is The Rose Code by Kate Quinn. 1940s, as England prepares to fight the Nazis, three very different women answer the call to the mysterious country estate Bletchley Park, where the best minds in Britain train to break German military codes. Vivacious debutante, Osla has everything, beauty, wealth, and the dashing Prince Philip of Greece sending her roses. But she burns to prove herself as more than a society girl and puts her fluent German to use as a translator of decoded enemy secrets. Imperious self-made mob, a product of East End London poverty, works the legendary code-breaking machines as she conceals old wounds and looks for a socially advantageous husband. Both Osla and Mob are quick to see the potential in local village spinster Beth, whose shyness conceals a brilliant facility with puzzles, and soon Beth spreads her wings as one of the park's few female crypt analysts. But war, loss, and the impossible pressure of secrecy will tear the three apart. 1947, as the royal wedding of Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip whips post-war Britain into a fever, the three friends turned enemies are united by a mysterious encrypted letter, the key to which lies buried in the long ago betrayal that destroyed their friendship and left one of them confined to an asylum. And Enigmatic traitor has emerged from the shadows of their Bletchley Park past, and now Oslo, Mob, and Beth must resurrect their old alliance and crack one of the last codes together. But each petal they remove from the Rose Code brings danger and their true enemy closer. This is American Dirt by Janine Cummings. Lydia Quizano Perez lives in the Mexican city of Acapulco, where she runs a bookstore. She is a son, Lucas, and a wonderful husband who is a journalist. And while there are cracks beginning to show in Acapulco because of drug cartels, her life, by and large, is fairly comfortable. Even though she knows they'll never sell, Lydia stocks some of her all-time favorite books in her store. And then one day, a man, Javier, enters the shop to browse and comes up to the register with a few books he would like to buy. Unbeknownst to Lydia, he is the jefe of the newest drug cartel that has gruesomely taken over the city. When Lydia's husband, when Lydia's husband's tell-all profile of Javier is published, none of their lives will ever be the same. Forced to flee, Lydia and her son, miles away, are instantly transformed into migrants. Lydia and Luca ride trains that make their way north to the United States, which is the only place Javier's reach doesn't extend. As they join countless people, Lydia soon sees everyone running from something. But what exactly are they running to? 
This is That Summer by Jennifer Weiner. Daisy Shoemaker can't sleep. With a thriving cooking business full of volunteer work, a beautiful home in Philadelphia, she should be content. But her teenage daughter can be a handful and her husband can be distant. Her work can be trivial and she has a lot of acquaintances but no real friends. Still, Daisy knows she's got it good. So why is she up all night? While Daisy tries to identify the root of her dissatisfaction, she's also receiving misdirected emails meant for another woman by the name of Diane Starling, whose email address is just one punctuation mark away from her own. While Daisy's driving carpools, Diana is chairing meetings. While Daisy is making dinner, Diana is making plans to reorganize corporations. Diana's glamorous, sophisticated, single lady life is miles away from Daisy's simpler existence. When apology leads to an invitation, the two women meet and become friends. But as they get closer, we learn that their connection was not completely accidental. Who is this woman and what does she want with Daisy? This next one is The Lions of Fifth Avenue by Fiona Davis. It's 1913 and on the surface, Laura Lyons couldn't ask for more out of life. But headstrong, passionate Laura wants more. And when she takes a leap of faith and applies to the Columbia Journalism School, her world would be cracked wide open. Her studies take her all over the city and she discovers a radical, all-female group in which women are encouraged to loudly share their opinions on suffrage, birth control, and women's rights. Soon, Laura finds herself questioning her traditional role as wife and mother. And when valuable books are stolen back at the library, threatening the home and institution she loves, she's forced to confront her shifting priorities head on and may just lose everything in the process. 80 years later, Sadie Donovan struggles with the legacy of her grandmother, the famous essayist, Laura Lyons, especially after she has wrangled, she has wrangled her dream job as curator at the New York Public Library. But the job quickly becomes a nightmare when rare manuscripts, notes, and books for the exhibit Sadie is running begins to disappear from the library's famous bird collection. Determined to save both the exhibit and her career, Sadie teams up with a private security expert to uncover the culprit. However, things unexpectedly become personal when the investigation leads Sadie to some unwelcoming truths about her own family heritage. Truths that shed new light on the biggest tragedy in the library's history. This next one is called The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. Hidden in the depths of 18th century London, a secret apothecary shop caters to the unusual kind of clientele. Women across the city of a mis whisper of a mysterious figure named Mel Nella who sells well-disguised poisons to use against the oppressive men in their lives. But the apothecary's faith is jeopardized when the newest patron, a precocious 12-year-old, makes a fatal mistake, sparking a string of consequences that echo through the centuries. Meanwhile, in present-day London, aspiring historian Caroline Pacewell spends her 10th wedding anniversary alone running from her own demons. When she stumbles upon a clue to the unsolved apothecary murders that haunted London 200 years ago, her life collides with the apothecaries in a stunning twist of fate, and not everyone will survive. The next title is Triple Chocolate Cheesecake Murder by Joanne Fluke. Hannah is up to her ears with Easter orders, rushing in at the cookie jar. 
plus a festive meal to prepare for a dinner party at her mother's penthouse. But everything comes to a crashing halt when Hannah receives a panicked call from her sister Andrea. Mayor Richard Bascombe has been murdered and Andrea is the prime suspect. Even with his reputation for being a bully, Mayor Bascombe, or Ricky Ticky, as Hannah's mother likes to call him, has been usually unusually testy in the days leading up to his death, leaving Hannah wonder if he knew he was in danger. Meanwhile, folks with a motive for the mayoral murder are popping up in Lake Eden. Was it an agitated colleague? A political rival? A jealous wife? Or a scorned mistress? As orders pile up at the cookie jar and children line up for Easter egg hunts, Hannah must spring into investigation mode and identify the real killer before another murder happens. And we have Daughters of Erie Town, a novel by Connie Schultz. 1957, Clayton Valley, Ohio. Ellie has the best grades in her class. Her dream is to go to nursing school and marry Rick McGinty. A basketball star, Rick has a chance to escape his abusive father and become the first person in his blue collar family to attend college. But when Ellie learns she is pregnant, everything changes. Just as Brick and Ellie revive their plans to build a family, a knock on the front door threatens to destroy their lives. The evolution of women's lives spanning the second half of the 20th century is at the center of this beautiful novel that richly portray how much people know and pretend not to know, and the secrets at the heart of a town and a family. Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This is a novel about the whirlwind rise of an iconic 1970s rock group and their beautiful lead singer, revealing the mystery behind their infamous breakup. Everyone knows Daisy Jones and the Six, but nobody knows the real reason why they split at the absolute height of their popularity, until now. This read like an episode of Behind the Music. If you enjoyed Cameron Crowe's Almost Famous, then this will be the hit for you. I did the audio version. It has multiple narrators and it's done in an interview style. So I highly recommend the book on CD, the digital download, or the play away. And if your child has not finished their summer reading yet and you need a quick book, I have three titles to finish with today. For the elementary crowd or the lower middle school, we have one of my favorites, Malamander by Thomas Taylor. It's a quirky, creepy fantasy set in Erie on the Sea. It has a colorful cast of characters and hot pursuit of a sea monster. It's winter in the town of Erie on the Sea where the mist is thick and the salt spray is rattling the windows of the Grand Nautilus Hotel. Inside, young Herbert Lemon, lost and founder for the hotel, has an unexpected visitor. It seems that Violet Parma, a fearless girl around his age, lost her parents at the hotel when she was a baby, and she's sure that the nervous Herbert is the one to help her find them. The trouble is, Violet's being pursued at the moment by a strange hook-handed man and the town legend of the Malamander, a part fish, part human monster, whose egg is said to make dreams come true, is rearing its scaly head. As various townspeople, some good-hearted, some nefarious, reveal themselves to be monster hunters on the sly, can Herbert and Violet elude them and discover what happened to Violet's family? This is the first in the trilogy, so if you like this, there are two more. The second is Gargantus, the third is Shadowgast. It comes out in the fall. The next one we have is called The Story Collector by Kristen O'Donnell Tubb. 
Eleven-year-old Viviana Fedler grew up surrounded by books, but now she's ready for her own story to begin. As the daughter of the library superintendent, Viviana has explored every nook, cranny, and room, except for the one her father keeps locked. When Viviani suspects the library is haunted, she decides to spook the new girl, Merit Mubarak, with a harmless little prank. What begins as a joke quickly gets out of hand. Soon, Viviani, Merit, and their friends have to solve two big mysteries. Is there really a ghost in the library? And did it steal the expensive stamp collection? When We Were Lost by Kevin Wignall. Tom Calloway never wanted to go on this trip. He doesn't like his classmates and doesn't care about learning everything. If it weren't for the fact that he had nowhere else to go that week while his guardian was away, he would have never boarded that plane. But that was before the crash, before all the teachers and most of his class didn't make it out alive, before he and the few kids left had to figure out how to survive before the remote, untamed jungle would find ways to take more lives, before the survivors began turning on each other. And I have one more title for you. This might be my favorite of the summer that I've read. It's called Pack Up the Moon by Kristen Higgins. Every month a letter. That's what Lauren decides to leave her husband when she finds out she's dying. Each month, she gives Josh a letter containing a task to help him face the first year without her, leading him on a heart-rending, beautiful, often humorous journey to find happiness again in this new life without his wife. This is for fans of P.S. I Love You by Cecilia Ahern, Me Before You by Jojo Moyes, or The Notebook by Nicholas Sparks. If you decide to take this, though, I would recommend having a box of tissues with you. If you're out on the beach, maybe a pair of sunglasses, because this will make you cry. For more information on our book club in a bag, or to place any of these titles we've shared with you today on hold, visit the website at www.westlakelibrary.org or give us a call at 440-871-2600 for more information. So we hope you enjoyed our recommendations. Have a great weekend and curl up with a good book.